Hi everyone. So at 10 o'clock this morning, I spent an hour doing Bible study. Little did I know, <clears throat> no one could see me. And my phone was in the kitchen and I am in my office at home. And uh, unfortunately, I did not see the many calls and texts uh, alerting me to the fact that uh, no one could see me or get in. Um, I did realize after this experience how many people love me, <laughs> worried about um, the fact that I had uh, fainted and or something and uh, didn't lo uh, log on for some emergency reason. Um, so in fact, uh, Brent Peterson was about to send uh, Heidi Trocht, my, one of my good friends, over to see if I was okay. I thought I was doing women's Bible study. So I'm going to do it again. <sighs> so if we were in a room together and we could uh, be with each other again um, in the way that we used to do Bible study, we would be able to ask um, everybody how their holiday was their Christmas, um, how they're doing, we could give each other hugs. So consider that you are hugged uh, this morning. And uh, I wish I could hear from you uh, how you've been doing and where you've been and what you've been up to. But here I am uh, talking to a screen. So can't have that kind of interaction. But I do feel um, that we did as well as we could um, last uh, semester in um, our Bible study online. And I am optimistic that um, we can do this well again. So uh, this quarter, I have chosen uh, the book of Hebrews. Um, I thought it might be a good idea to review um, our years together, um, where we have been before. And so uh, we've done a lot of biblical books. We've done Philippians, Ephesians, James, um, Romans. I continue to get feedback about how much uh, people enjoyed Romans. So uh, maybe we'll do that again in the future. Uh, last year, we started with 1 Corinthians. And then this past year, um, in the fall, we did 2 Corinthians. And um, so now we're doing Hebrews. What I need to let you know is um, I am not as familiar with the book of Hebrews at all. And so I am, uh, I've picked a book that um, I am going to have to learn along with you. Now in the past, I have loved several passages in Hebrews. Um, I've loved different chapters, but I have not um, studied context, um, where it came from, who wrote it. Um, I had some idea, but um, this will be the first time that I go through the book and um, look at commentaries every week and try to um, organize it in such a way that it becomes um, alive for you. Um, I don't know all the ends and out of it, and so we are going to very much be doing this um, together. We are going uh, from January 12th, which is today, until March 2nd, and I'm not quite sure if I have decided yet whether to continue in uh, the next quarter with the book of Hebrews or whether I'll try to complete it um, in these eight weeks. Um, as you probably know, um, there are 13 chapters and 13 does not go into 8. 
And so uh, we are going to be taking larger chunks of uh, Hebrews in order to try to get those 13 chapters into the eight weeks. Now, if I do next week's lesson and I find that it's just too much material, um, we might uh, go back. But um, uh, I might go back and, sorry, um, rethink this and then uh, push it out into um, May. Okay, um, just so you know, I have not done homework for you, and I apologize for that. Um, I over break, I had a, um, another book due to the publisher, and I have not finished that yet. I am getting there, um, which is odd for me. I usually make my deadlines. So I was writing the book and I was preparing for classes, which um, start today. So one thing that went um, by the wayside was um, preparing your homework booklet. But I promise you that will be done today. And um, uh, will give you opportunity, if you so choose, um, to work through Hebrews with some uh, probing questions each week um, during the week. Um, for next uh, Tuesday, um, be looking at chapter 1, verse 1, through chapter 2, uh, verse 18. And uh, during that time, we're going to talk about um, the finality of Christianity. So you'll want to tune in um, to learn what that means. Okay, let's go back um, now to the beginning of the book of Hebrews. And I'd like to talk today about context. Now, usually when we talk about the context of a book, even the books that we have studied together, um, we go through a series of questions. For example, uh, who wrote it? Who was it written to? Uh, when was it written? What is the cultural context uh, of that, uh, usually city? And so um, we just need to start with the awareness that the book of Hebrews is weird. It's really odd. Very different from any book that we have studied before. And why do I say that? For several reasons. Uh, we don't know who the author is. <coughs> Sorry, that's Finney. Um, let me put a pause button on here. Um, during the first time that I thought I was recording this, I put uh, Finney in my bedroom and he barked the entire time. Um, it was very sad to me. And so I decided now doing this again, that Finney would have um, the lay of the house and hopefully he does not disturb us too much. Um, but he might bark uh, during uh, the hour we have together. By the way, Finney is now a moose he went from this little tiny puppy into this huge, huge dog at five months. And it just really amazes me. I'll try to get Finney some week uh, to make an appearance. Okay, what I was saying, um, we don't know who the author is. We don't know who the recipients are. We don't know when it is written. We do not know where the uh, recipients live. And so I'm going to go over some of that today. Um, and also the question, well, how did the book of Hebrews get into the canon? So first of all, let's start with what do we guess about the audience? I want to make sure I didn't miss a page. I'm sorry. I wonder where that page is. Give me a second. They got all mixed up because I've already done this. Huh. I 
like I'm missing a page. Anyway, I'll continue. Um, so what do we guess about the audience? And when I say guess, I mean that um, all of this audience, where, when, who, um, is a very much a mystery to us. And why is it a mystery? Um, because we don't know the answers to these questions. Now, biblical scholars are really important because they um, interpret, they usually give us really good answers to that question, um, and their knowledge is important. But um, when it comes to the book of Hebrews, everything is a guess, a scholarly guess. And um, so we want to depend on them, certainly, but the most that we know about Hebrews comes from within Hebrews. Um, so internal investigation into the book itself gives us some clues, but not very many clues. So let me go back to the audience. Who received this letter? And how do we determine some best guesses about that? Well, just so you know, um, the label to the Hebrews was not um, originally uh, associated with this writing. And so um, it wasn't until the late 100s, so 100 years after it was written, that this um, statement of Book of Hebrews was added um, to this um, work of writing. And so we believe that it's very much an editorial label. Somebody decided um, to label it that way. So what do we do with that? Um, was this label based on a knowledge of the original audience or on the content since it contains so many Old Testament references. So was this editor reading and then came up with this idea that maybe this was written to uh, Jewish people? Or did that editor have some sort of knowledge uh, that had been passed down for those hundred years? Um, we probably should say that um, the editor read it rather than the editor um, having knowledge because we hear nothing um, in the early church, uh, the patristic period particularly, um, to label it that way. We don't have any knowledge from uh, uh, before uh, this date when the editor um, gives it that name. But we do not know um, if it was written to Jewish people at all. Um, it is possible that it was written to um, Jewish and Gentile people, or even just Gentile people. So I'm going to go through some of these um, best guesses and why um, some scholars end up in certain places. So the reason why um, perhaps the editor put uh, the book of Hebrews um, is that it seems to be written uh, maybe to Jewish people because of all of the extensive references in the book itself to the Old Testament. The Old Testament um, figures prominently um, in this work. Um, and so perhaps we can conclude that the Jewish folks um, had a deep understanding of the Old Testament and and would have the writer would have assumed um, that they would have had um, the background to understand what uh, the author was saying. But we need to realize that Gentiles who become Christian, also became very well versed in the Old Testament. Why is that? 
It is because during the time of Jesus, and um, we'll talk about this later, all the way up to um, the time that we canonize a New Testament, that the only thing that they had that they uh, recognized as scripture was the Old Testament. Those were the scriptures. So if uh, Christians, whether Jew or Gentile, um, was studying scripture, it meant that they were studying the Old Testament. So just because there's so many Old Testament references, it doesn't mean that um, Gentiles are cut out of the picture. Well, one of the internal concerns of the author is a concern for apostasy. Now, what does apostasy mean? Um, it means uh, committing yourself to a particular religion, in this case, Christianity, and then making a decision to turn one's back um, and to go backwards, um, back to their life before Christian faith. <clears throat> now, some of us would think that is unimaginable. Um, there are there's this sense that once somebody has tasted um, that the Lord is good, why would they then renounce faith? But it, it does happen. And the author of Hebrews is deeply concerned that um, this might be where uh, the audience is. But what would apostasy mean <clears throat> for a Jew versus a Gentile? A Jew if they rejected uh, Jesus and Christianity, would go back to their founding religion, Judaism, which, according to the writer, uh, would not cut them off from the knowledge of God completely, for they still had the Old Testament. So they might have um, rejected Christianity, but they still stood in um, the Judeo-Christian tradition. A Gentile, however, if they committed apostasy, what are they going to go back to? They are going to go back to paganism or atheism. And so um, that would cut them off from the Old Testament and from the Jewish faith. And so if apostasy means um, completely leaving um, Christianity, that might fit better uh, to a Gentile audience. Now, there are some who believe that the author um, would have been familiar with the Essenes or the Qumran sects of Judaism. And um, you could read that the author then is writing to converts um, of those two groups. So who were they? Um, without getting into a lot of detail, we um, can say that they were a couple of things. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, Jews who were not centered around Jerusalem, which most Jews in the early church were, until they scattered after the year 700, sorry, 70. But these were not in the uh, kind of center of Jewish life. They had decided to separate themselves. And um, I'll use this word. Um, into little monasteries, shall we say. They were known as being kind of extremist when it came to self-discipline. That is Finney trying to eat my books. Sorry. Um, so maybe the author was appealing to um, these two groups um, in terms of keeping them in Christian faith as converts um, to Christianity. And so we would um, probably want to say this most strongly, that uh, the audience is 
Christians who probably are Jewish, at least some of them. But the Jews uh, the author is addressing are Hellenistic Jews. Now, what does that mean? To uh, talk about Hellenism is to talk about Greek history and Greek culture. And so there are Jews who have been um, Hellenized um, or deeply influenced by Greek culture rather than staying um, isolated as the Jews did um, before Christ and um, after. And so uh, Hellenistic Jews are influenced um, deeply by uh, philosophy, um, by a political system, um, sort of this Roman um, world in which Christianity is born. So Greek and, and Roman. And so it's an interesting statement for the scholars to say these are probably Hellenized Jews. Also, we are pretty sure that, again, these were not Jews um, who were around Jerusalem. We know that um, the church, the Christian church, um, was uh, based in Jerusalem. It's one of the most prominent, one of the most important churches. We believe that it was led by James. Um, a lot of it really important things happen in Jerusalem. So this audience, the scholars believe, is not uh, kind of in that center of Christianity, but uh, away from it. So I have a long quote here um, from a scholar in the late 20th century named F.F. F. Bruce. I will be using uh, his commentary of Hebrews as we go through this. And so I have a fairly long quote, but I think it summarizes some of the beliefs about who these people were. He writes, the addressees appear then to have been a group of Jewish Christians who had never seen or heard Jesus in person, but learned from him from someone who had um, himself listened to Jesus. Since their conversion, they had been exposed to persecution, particularly at one stage shortly after the beginning of their Christian career, but while they had to endure public abuse, some imprisonment, and the looting of their property, they had not been called on to die for their faith. They had given a practical evidence of their faith by serving their fellow Christians, and especially by caring for those of their number who had suffered most in the time of persecution. Yet their Christian development had been arrested. Instead of pressing ahead, they were inclined to come to a full stop in their spiritual progress, if not indeed to slip back to a stage which they had left. Most probably, they were reluctant to sever their last ties with a religion, meaning Judaism, which enjoyed the protection of Roman law and faced the risk of irrevocable commitment to the Christian way um, which I'll add, persecutions continue to increase, even uh, martyrdom. When someone was a, a Jew, they had a, a special um, dispensation from Rome that they did not have to sacrifice to pagan gods or worship the emperor. But Christianity um, finally became seen in Rome as its own religion. Sorry, that was me trying to elaborate. Let's see, where am I? The writer who has known them or known about them for a considerable time feels a pastoral concern for their welfare 
warns them against falling back, for this may result in falling away from their Christian faith altogether. He encourages them with the assurance that they have everything to lose if they fall back and everything to gain as they press on. We may infer from the epistle that they were Hellenists. They knew the Old Testament in the Greek version instead of Hebrew. It implied too, it is implied that their knowledge of the ancient sacrificial rituals of Israel was derived from reading the Old Testament, not from first hand contact with the temple services in Jerusalem. Perhaps they formed a house church within the wider fellowship of a city church and were tending to neglect the bonds of fellowship that bound them to other Christians outside their inner circle at the time that this was written. F.F. Uh, F. Bruce. So what are our best guesses about the author? Best guesses, but really, at the end, we really do not know. So let me go through some of the ideas um, from the history of the church. <clears throat> the first thing I need to say is one of the most important early church figures is a, a gentleman by the name of Clement, and we designate him as Clement of Rome. He was a uh, bishop. He was a writer. Um, we have two epistles from Clement, and at one time we thought that perhaps they would make it into the canon of Scripture. So why do I bring up Clement, who is, who is writing right around the year 100? S Clement is silent about who wrote the book. <clears throat> you would think if anybody knew who wrote the book, Clement would be one and that he would tell us. But he is silent about it. One of the first um, ideas that comes, but it does not come until the 300s, is that Paul wrote it. Um, they were gathering a list of all of the epistles in the New Testament that they knew Paul wrote, and someone decided uh, to put this in that list. But this, throughout the history of the church, has been contested. Um, for example, Calvin uh, very strongly said there's no way that uh, Paul wrote this letter. Uh, Luther says the same thing. There have been other people throughout the history of Christianity who um, are very uh, strong and sure that Paul did not write it. How do we know that? Um, it's because the style of Greek is so different than the rest of the books that Paul wrote, that um, it's very difficult uh, to say that Paul put down his usual language and idioms and favorite words um, to pick up a completely different uh, syntax and um, vocabulary um, and very different Greek expressions um, to write this book. So probably no scholars today would um, suggest that Paul wrote the book of Hebrews. Another suggestion uh, sort of along this line is that Paul might have written this book in Hebrew. That would be different than any other book. And that he had a translator, perhaps even Luke himself. And so the translator perhaps of Paul's Hebrew book um, was someone who used a very different style of Greek and Luke did. That's one thought. Another thought is that um, maybe Luke wrote this outright. Maybe he wrote a gospel 
and then the Acts of the Apostles, and a letter as well. But we do not know. Um, another interesting theory is that Barnabas might have written uh, the book of Hebrews. Um, this theory is uh, supported slightly by a um, early patristic writer named Tertullian, who is writing in the 200s. Um, he suggested that maybe Barnabas had written it. Now, again, when we have <clears throat> somebody who makes an affirmation like that, are they basing it on knowledge that has been passed down? Or is Tertullian himself making a guess? And then we have a really interesting theory. Uh, not that I say that this is the right one, but I kind of like it. Is that the book was written by Priscilla and Aquila who are prominent figures in um, early Christianity. Um, we know that they um, have been the leaders of a church. We know that um, Paul is particularly appreciative of their ministry. He names them um, in the last chapter of Romans. If you remember in 1 Corinthians um, and 2 Corinthians, they are mentioned. And so, <clears throat> it would be a really interesting thing if Priscilla and Aquila ended up writing this, and probably Priscilla, because she really is the powerhouse of the couple, and um, probably more educated, actually. Well, that's an interesting conclusion, isn't it? So again, we don't know who wrote it. We don't know to whom it is written, although we have some clues about what they might be like. Um, we do not know when it was written, and we really do not know the uh, geographical location of the people. So Hebrews is weird. Hebrews is uh, mysterious in a way. Which brings us to another extremely interesting question. How did it get in the New Testament? If we don't know these things about this epistle, then we can't base its entry into the New Testament on the usual criteria. And one of those criteria um, is that the writer had to be an apostle. And Paul, of course, calls himself an apostle. And so we recognize him as that, even though not one of the 12. So um, it had to be written by one of the 12, or it had to be written by somebody uh, very closely associated. For example, we get the book of Mark. Um, because uh, we think Mark is depending greatly on the testimony of Peter. Um, same with Luke. But this is a mystery. There is no close association that we can prove. How did we get the canon, by the way? The Old Testament was closed um, early in the first century, um, and it was a council of Jewish um, members who finally decided what would be in or out of the Old Testament. When it comes to the New Testament, it's a much more complicated story. Um, there are books, epistles, that are associated um, with these apostles and become very early recognized as the really important books to read and um, to pay attention to. So there was sort of a um, organic or spontaneous recognition that these are our really important books. 
Um, now, that is a developmental process. In the year 200, we have something called the Muratorian Canon, which has um, recognized many of these books and letters um, as authority for the church. But we do not, um, at that point, have a closed canon where other books can be added. We get to the year 325, and Constantine um, wants to hold a council, the Council of Nicaea, that's where we get the Nicene Creed. And he says, I would like to have a, a Bible to, to look at while I'm there. Well, you don't tell the emperor that you have not finalized a Bible. <laughs> and so they scurried around and put together um, a list of uh, books and bind them together and give them to Constantine. But it really isn't until 367 where the canon is closed. They decide which books are in and which books are out. Um, there were some that all the way to the end. Uh, we thought they might make it. Um, Clement is one of those. Another one is called um, the Shepherd of Hermas. I almost made it into scripture, which would have been interesting. It's this kind of weird um, apocalyptic uh, little book. Um, so in the end, Hebrews makes it into the canon um, without having the criteria of what usually was uh, determined as the reason why something would be included. Now I could tell you to um, go home and cut Hebrews out of your New Testament and uh, throw it away, burn it, or <laughs> We can trust the providence of God that what books um, were placed in the canon should have been in the canon. Um, we do know quite strongly that the themes and the content of the book of Hebrews um, fit very much the themes of the New Testament. We don't have anything here that's um, out in um, right field that, um, right field, left field, oh well, nothing in its content um, is outside of the major themes of the Gospels, the writings of Paul, the writings of John, um, and so thematically in its theology um, it fits very well with the rest of the New Testament canon. So I tend to want to believe, um, rather than it being an accident that Hebrews um, made it, is that um, God knew that the content of the book would be uh, an important source um, for the church uh, to depend on. So the book of Hebrews um, is there, and we get to study it. So, <clears throat> what are the major themes? Um, these are mine. I read through the whole book, and these are some of the uh, important um, unifying themes uh, throughout the book of Hebrews. So I have just a few of those. First of all, um, in the early chapters, the author wants to make sure that we understand that Jesus is better than everything that has come before. We might say that the revelation of God through history, or through the writings of the Old Testament, um, as was as a revelation, but a revelation uh, sort of through 
a glass darkly, to quote Paul. Um, but when Jesus comes, um, this is the finality of the revelation of God. This is the full revelation of God. It corresponds to everything that has come before, but in the person of Jesus, um, we have the full revelation. And in Christ, we see God fully revealed. And so Hebrews uh, takes up that theme. Um, he'll talk about um, Jesus being better than the angels or Jesus being uh, better than humanity. Um, but at the same time, the book of Hebrews does not shy away from affirming the full humanity of Christ. So this is the next theme. Jesus is fully human. Uh, that's not just a theological statement for the author. Jesus is fully human so that he might be able to empathize with us completely in our human condition. Um, there's a verse that says Jesus was tempted in every way that we are, yet without sin. But he entered fully into uh, the, the human condition um, to, to be with us, to experience everything that we experience. But not only is he an empathizer, he is also a savior who redeems human beings. And so a important theme um, in the book of Hebrews is seeing Jesus as our savior and particularly the mechanism of that salvation comes from seeing Jesus as the last sacrifice. We know, of course, that Judaism, up until the first century, um, sacrificed animals as a way of atoning for their sins. And uh, the book of Hebrews wants to make clear that um, Jesus is the last sacrifice because those kind of animal sacrifices are no longer um, needed because Christ has done everything. Uh, to enable our forgiveness, repentance, and a new human life. Um, as John the Baptist says, this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. A bit later in uh, the book, we have uh, Jesus as the author and finisher of our faith. And along with that, we have the wonderful faith chapter. We have a list of Old Testament figures of people who have been faithful, even though they do not see the fulfillment of um, what they are, are anticipating. It. And that, of course, would be Jesus. They are faithful. Well, not only um, is Jesus the author of our faith, he also wants to be the finisher of our faith. So just as everything that came before was not quite uh, completed, um, Jesus wants to complete in us, begin in us, uh, complete in us um, maturity, he wants to complete in us uh, wholeness. He wants to complete in us, of course, um, in the end, where we will join the great cloud of witnesses. Um, but Jesus is here not just to save us, but to move us on um, to the fullness of salvation in the Christian life. Um, if you listened well, so to speak, um, that would be sanctification. And one thing I'd like to, to end with here is that whether or not you're listening to a sermon or a Bible study or doing your own devotions, there is a key question 
that we should always ask ourselves. We shouldn't just hear, even from the Word of God itself, new knowledge, although knowledge is very, very important. Um, what we should be asking ourselves, it should be in the very forefront of our minds, is that when we read, when we hear, when we receive, we should always ask the question, how then do we live? How do we take what we have learned in our minds and even in our hearts, how do we take that and then live differently? What is uh, the Holy Spirit challenging us to change, perhaps? If we can see that the Word of God is food, we don't just um, chew it. We don't just swallow it. It becomes um, life energy for us. It becomes um, a food that then gives us the energy um, to express itself in very practical ways. And so I hope that as we go through the book of Hebrews, that you will keep that in the forefront of your mind, because uh, the writer does um, sort of take us through a journey um, of the Old Testament, take us through a journey of how Christ fulfills that. Um, lots of theology there, but a theology that stays in the mind um, is not what God intends for us. God intends for us to take the knowledge that we have, the learning that we receive, um, and to take that in in such a way that we are transformed, that we are changed, that we live out the gospel in very practical ways. So that's where we're going in the next eight weeks. And um, again, for next week, you should look at um, chapter 1 through chapter 2, verse 18. Well, I've done this twice today. Um, I am very um, hopeful that you will turn it, tune in and uh, watch it later. And um, we had a rough start, but I am very hopeful for what um, lay ahead for us. Let me pray. Oh, one more thing. Sorry. Um, I am the pastor of uh, congregational care at College Church. And um, I am there for you. So if you ever have any needs whatsoever, need someone to talk to, have prayer requests, uh, need the church to um, rally around you in some sort of crisis, I would be that contact person. I, I love you. And also, um, I didn't say at the beginning, which I did the first time, um, is um, we're glad that any of you who are new are turn tuning in. We are so glad you're here. You are very much welcome. There is no requirement that you join a small group, but even those who are watching across the country, if you would like to be in a small group, um, we would love to have you. Now, what does that mean? It means that you have a group leader who um, takes a caring role for you, who will keep the small group in community um, through emails and phone calls. And if you um, would like to join, no matter where you are, um, just call the church office and uh, we can register you for free um, as a small group attendee. Okay, now let's pray. Holy God, I thank you this morning that um, technology, even though sometimes it fails us, uh, still gives us many good gifts. And I thank you that uh, this morning um, I'm able to try again and have people tune in later. Um, 
I also thank you, of course, for the Word of God, the written Word of God that testifies to the living, embodied Word of God, your Son, Jesus Christ. You did not leave us up to our own devices to try to figure out how to live this Christian life, but you revealed to particular authors, whether we know them or not, um, truths that um, impact and change us. And so I do pray as we go through the book of Hebrews that it would be a means of grace to us, that it would be food to us, that you would nourish us through it. Um, we want you to be our teacher, Holy Spirit, and uh, we commit these weeks to you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Thanks for joining in. I'm sorry I was absent. <laughs> um, I wasn't absent to me. I thought I was doing it, but absent to you at 10 o'clock. But I hope you all um, have tuned in and uh, watched it at some point this week. Take care. Love you.